We are in a new series uh, called uh, Who Do You Say That I Am? And uh, we are basically asking you to ask the most important question you could ever ask in your life. Above every other question that you could ask, this is the most important one. Because if you, your answer to this question will dictate the rest of your life. It will determine the rest of your life. It will set the, the compass for the rest of your life. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that Jesus is? Of course, the disciples were asked this question by Jesus. He said to them, who do others say that I am? And they responded, well, some say Elijah, some say a prophet, some even say John the Baptist back from the dead, which is pretty cool if you can be a guy back from the dead. But Jesus doesn't let the disciples escape with that. He always personalized it, and he turned to them and then said, but yeah, but who do you say that I am? Of course, in the passage, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Peter, for you didn't come up with this on your own. But the Holy Spirit has revealed it to you. You see, this question determines everything in your life. It determines that you give up maybe two hours on Sunday morning. You go to this building and you gather with strangers that you might not have anything else ever to do with because they're weird. And you hang out and you sing songs and you, you listen to someone speak and you look at each other on the way home and you go, that was either good or bad and you have roasted preacher for dinner. And then you're even more crazy because some of you are like so radically committed to the truth that you like give up 10% of your income. And you go, I'm going to go donate, donate that to the church and they're going to do kingdom of God work. Why? Because I believe that the answer to who do you say that I am means that i got to behave this way. It means that some of you stayed in relationships that you should have walked away from. Some of you walked away from relationships that you should have walked away from a long time ago. Some of you give forgiveness out like it's going out of style, like orange shag carpet. Some of you love in extravagant ways and the rest of the world scratches their head. When you're at work, people look at you and they go, what is different? And you live with an authenticity and a spiritual depth that others can't comprehend. And even when the rest of the world crumbles down on you and around you, you live with a peace of mind that says, you know what? The Lord God gives and God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All because of your answer to this one question. Who do you say that I am. Changes everything. Changes how you work. It changes how you do relationships. It changes how you behave. It changes how you think. It even changes at times how you dress. It changes everything. And so this next three weeks we want to spend some time answering and asking the question, who do you say that I am? Because each one of us has to personalize the question and eventually come up with an answer that says, this is who I believe Jesus is. And we'll spend some time digging into some historical concepts next week. And we're going we're gonna to wade our way through that a little bit. But this week, I wanted to give Jesus the chance to answer this for himself. Who do you say that I am? And I always think if we're going to ask the question, we should give Jesus a chance to say, well, this is who I am. And so today we're going to look at John 15. If you've got a Bible, want to open it up to John 15. Of course, we encourage everybody to grab your e-vice and go with us in there. And you know, We like the version Bible app, but you can do whatever you want. John 15 is where we're going to start. And it's basically Jesus giving the message to the disciples, saying to them, this is who I think I am. And at that point in time, we can either choose to believe that Jesus actually knows who he is and understands who he is, or we can think, as C.S. Lewis says, he is a crazy lunatic, maybe the devil himself, out to deceive us. But we are not left with the option that he was a good guy or a good teacher. Because you can't say that you're God and be a good teacher. So this is what Jesus says. I'm going to pause just a moment and read this entire section to you. We're going to go all the way to verse 6. You ready? Jesus says, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Did you know that if you have a grapevine, if you don't prune it, it won't bear fruit? If you just let it go, it'll just put out flowers. You actually have to prune, cut back the branch in order for the grapevine to produce fruit. 
He prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Then Jesus says this, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. Duh. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Last section. Then Jesus says this. Next slide. Go to my notes. I am the vine. You are the branches. I was trying to read it up there. Now I'm going to read it down here. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do some things. You know, it's really scary when you read the Bible and it's an absolute. And what I mean by that is it's like always, nothing, never. I like to live in the gray area. And then Jesus gives us this, this absolute. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. All right, now let me just pause real quick. And let me crawl into one piece of this that is huge before we get into the whole uh, simile of what it means to be branches and vines. Jesus starts off the whole message with this claim, I am. He says the true vine. But every one of Jesus' listeners at the time would have heard Jesus immediately say, I am. And the Greek word Jesus used there, they all would have paused and went, wait a second, did he just claim to be God? He just, he, did you hear that? He just said, I was God. <laughs> Not a single listener at the time of Jesus would have been confused as to what Jesus thought about himself. Now this is important and huge because here's what I want you to do. I love working with, with new Christians. I love working with our high school and middle school kids because they ask questions that those of us who have been in church a while, we kind of forget to ask and we gloss over. And so a couple weeks ago, I was talking to one of our high school kids and they said to me, hey, I don't understand, why did they kill Jesus? And I said, well, you know, because Jesus had to die for our sins. They said, yeah, 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 I got that, but why did they kill him? And I went, ooh. You know, you're asking a really good question. And again, it's one that we in church on a regular basis because we want to go straight to the, the, the theological mission of Jesus. We forget to ask. And it's important for us to pause right here and go, it's because Jesus said, I am. Let me point it to you this way. It says, because if you're looking at Jesus, and you say, here's a guy who takes a Happy Meal. There's 5,000 hungry people plus. Jesus takes a Happy Meal and feeds 5,000 hungry people with a Happy Meal. Is that a reason to kill somebody? No, that's a reason to celebrate, right? That's the guy you want at your party. Hey, Jesus, we're a little low on cheese and crackers. Got this. Boop. You know, ooh, hey, thank you, man. You are at every party from now on. You are never having a party without Jesus, okay? No, that's not a reason to kill him. Jesus walks around. What's he do on a regular basis? We have stories of Jesus healing the blind, healing the lepers, even raising the dead. Is that a reason to kill someone? No. Again, that's the guy you want. Hey, Jesus, we're going to go to the nursing home. You want to come with us? Yeah, okay. It's great. Oh, yeah, I love having you at the nursing home. It's so amazing. All these wheelchairs are empty. People leaving, heading back to the life they used to have. You need to come hang out with us, Jesus. All right? That's not a reason to kill someone. And we also then have even the most audacious story of Jesus, the most radical, uh, emotionally charged story of Jesus. And that is Jesus makes a whip in the temple and he drives the money changers out who are corrupt and they're stealing from the people and they're robbing from the people. And you crawl in the history of that and you see that the, the temple system has become so corrupt that it's become a monopolized system of like Caiaphas right now. And Jesus runs them out of there with a whip and he's angry. But the people celebrate it because he's a hero because they've all wanted to say, hey, the system's broken. You're corrupt. You're stealing from us. Even then, that's not a reason to kill somebody. The reason Jesus was killed was because of this claim where he says, I am. Now this is huge because so many people in our culture, they want to twist the word, they want to shape it a different way into their own image, and they, they have a Jesus who doesn't claim to be God. They have a Jesus who doesn't fully understand that he's God. They have a Jesus who doesn't even believe that he's God. But the reality of it is you can't get past the historical Jesus without going, hey, he thought he was God. He thought he was God. It was his belief that he was God that caused us to kill him. Now let me pause. I want to tell you how organized we become because it's a little scary and we celebrate this. All right? We are going to have every sermon from here through Christmas celebrate three constant themes at this moment. 
All right? And you're going to see them pop up in every sermon. All right? The themes are this. God's salvation plan does three things. Number one, it discloses the heart. He fills the heart. And then he changes the heart. He discloses the heart. He fills the heart. And he changes the heart. Today we're going to look at God disclosing the heart. Changing the heart and filling the heart. Remember I told you he was killed because he believed he was God. He disclosed to everybody else what was going on. The light of Jesus has come and it's like looking into a mirror and suddenly you go, oh my gosh, I didn't know my face was that muddy. You know, when you're walking around, I'm asking my friend, hey, do I look bad? And I said, no, 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 you don't, not so much here or here, but right here, right? I didn't know I looked so bad, but suddenly the light of Jesus is shown in the mirror and suddenly I go, oh my gosh. How did I get so filthy? How did I get so dirty? John 3, 20, verse 21. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes to light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Here's what I'm saying. When Jesus claims to be this God, he discloses the heart. He reveals the intentions of our deeds and what we desire. And when our heart is disclosed by the Father and before the Father, we have two reactions that are possible. Either we can turn to Jesus and admit that we are a mess in need of a divine doctor, that we are broken, burdened, wounded, and wandering, and in need of a Savior, or we can run away or try to snuff out the light. Either way, either way, we must come into contact with Jesus saying, who do you say that I am? And that revelation moment of the light shining on us, either we admit I need or we try to snuff out the light. There's nothing like being grafted onto the vine to realize how distorted we have become. I no longer even produce grapes. I mean, it reminds me of a story. Three guys, they went camping. And as they were camping and hiking to the campsite, this terrible storm popped up out of nowhere. Hurricane-type winds. And if you've ever been hiking in the woods in the midst of a storm, you know it's a pretty scary place to be. Lightning, thunder, is this tree going to come down and kill us or not? We don't know. There's no really where to go. And they see this old abandoned cabin up on the hill. And so all three guys decide they're going to run to that old abandoned cabin. They get up in there, and it's, it's nasty. It's creaky. No one's living in here for years. But they're going to wait out the storm in the cabin. And so they wait. They wait. They wait. They do dinner. They wait. They play some cards. They wait, but this is one of those storms that's lasting all day. It's like a 24-hour storm. And so eventually, about midnight, they decide, you know what, this is where we're going to camp. So they get out their sleeping bags, and they don't bother putting up a tent. They just lay right there on the floor of this old abandoned cabin. And there they are. They're fast asleep. About 3 a.m., the first gentleman wakes up. He hears this huge noise in the corner of the room. He goes, what was that? And he's searching around for his flashlight. He's searching around for his flashlight. And he can't find it. He can't find it. And he, and he whispers to the guy, Hey, are you guys awake? The second gentleman goes, Well, of course. I barely slept at all. The third gentleman goes, I haven't slept at all either. We've been awake the whole night. In fact, we've been wondering how you sleep through this. And he goes, well, I'm going to find my flash. I'm going to see what it is. And the second gentleman goes, No! First guy gets a little startled. He's like, I'm just looking for a flashlight. Why are we so excited? Because don't shine a light anywhere. He goes, well, why don't you want me to shine a light? I want to see what's going on. He says, because all night there's been something crawling across the bottom of my sleeping bag. In fact, there's something slithering across my leg right now. The third guy goes, yeah, there's a growling noise over in the corner. And something actually crawled into my sleeping bag. He goes, well, don't you want me to shine a light and figure out what it is? He goes, no, 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 no. There's this weird noise over by the door. The third guy goes, yes, and the ground seems to be moving and making weird noises. The first guy goes, all the more reason to shine a light. Let's see what danger we're in. The two men reply to the first in unison. We would rather die in the dark and face the reality of our situation in the light. Let me say that again. We would rather die in the dark than face the reality of our situation in the light. There is nothing like the light of Jesus to suddenly show what a mess we've made out of our life. When we get connected to the vine, 
suddenly we go, man, things are not as they are supposed to be. All this because Jesus says, I am. Now from here on out, I've got to be honest with you. The whole simile of Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, it gets a little goofy for me. Because quite honestly, I've never harvested grapes. I've never went out and picked a bunch of grapes. I've never had a vine trellis. I've never tried to graft a vine in. I've never tried to do anything like that. I've got a cousin who works in the Netherlands, and he's like a vine and wine connoisseur guy. And when he explains his job to me and what all that takes, I glaze over. I get lost. It sounds very technical. It's just one of those things I don't understand. I don't even do gardening well. Right? I'm really good at planting stuff and then growing weeds. Right? And the animals come and they eat the food. So, so the whole vine imagery, I get a little lost on it. I started thinking through this and I thought, I wonder if anybody in our church in the last, say, year, six months has even done this as well. How many of you on a regular basis see vines? How many of you see vines that you're growing, that you're grafting, that you're caring for, that you're pruning? And at that point in time, I thought, you know what, this is, this is good stuff. I mean, it's historical. Jesus is referencing the history of Israel being called the, the, the vineyard and, and the vines. And so there's a lot of history in what Jesus is saying. And I don't want to downplay any of that, but I, I wondered, what would it be like to modernize this so that it makes sense? And so at the, at the potential of a little blasphemy here and we're all going to go to hell, uh, I want to just modernize this just a bit and just see what it would look like if Jesus walked into my living room and he said, you know, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and I would just stop him and say, Jesus, that's awesome. Like the Jews in your day and the people you were talking to, they understood it. I don't understand anymore. I don't have vines. I don't have branches. I don't, I don't, I don't do any of that. Can you, can you help modernize this a little more? And so I spent like weeks trying to figure out what would Jesus use? What would he say? And I thought through this and this and this and this and this. And I finally came up with this. You ready? I think Jesus might say something, <coughs> something like this. Jesus might say, I am the electricity. And you are the vacuum. Because we all know what a vacuum is, right? We all know what this does. It's common. We'd all go, oh, okay. And then we'd all stare at Jesus and go, really? And I just need to be honest with you. From this on out, this point on out, this message might suck. It might just sweep you off your feet. I don't know. I just want one of those that could go either way. It's just... Come on. Those were good. It just hurt my feelings. Of course, I might just be the new nuisance that you're waiting for it to end so you can continue with your TV show, right? Jesus says, I am the vine, John 15, 5 through 6. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who remains in me and I am him will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus might say, I am the electricity. You are the vacuum. Without electricity, you can do nothing. Though you're still a vacuum. You still bear the image of God, but you are powerless. You are dead. So if I were up here on the stage, and I just started out this morning, and I'm up here. And you walked in, and you saw me doing this. First of all, half of you that know me well would be like, you know, anybody else doing that, that would seem weird. But, you know, it's, it's Aaron. It might be something normal. I wonder where he's going with that, right? And then, and then up here, I might even do this if I wanted to really fool you. I might go... Right? And eventually one of you would have the courage to walk up and go... You know, you have to turn that on. Right? And I would say, but I'm sweep. I'm cleaning. You would say, you're not connected to what? You're not connected to the power source. And when you're not connected to the power source and you're a vacuum cleaner, you can do what? Nothing. I mean, you're a giant paperweight. How cool is that? You're not a very good decoration, but you're a giant paperweight, right? Apart from the power source, you can do nothing. Apart from the power source, you can do nothing. Jesus says, I am the vine, and my Father is the gardener. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Go to the next slide. Here's what I was thinking, though. I was thinking through this, and I thought, 
Let me play this out. And so for a couple weeks, I've been rolling this whole simile out in my head. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away. He's saying, hey, if you're not plugged in, eventually you become useless. Again, it's not very good as a decoration. It's just, it's just a vacuum cleaner. Next slide. And here's what I find interesting. Jesus uses this word here that I think we miss sometimes when we read it. And again, because we don't understand vines and stuff, we have to crawl into it a little bit. He says, I am the true vine. Meaning that there are other vines that were not true. That deceived you. That you may have grafted into. That you may have said, I want to attach to that, I want to attach to that. And you got onto it and suddenly went, there's no life-giving force in this. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. What's a gardener do? Take care of flowers or crops, again, whatever they're growing, right? But a gardener has to get in. They have to care for the soil. <clears throat> they have to weed. They have to take care of this. So I wonder, like, what would I say if Jesus said, I am the gardener? What would that look like? And how do we do this? And here's what the gardener does. He prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And you are already clean because of the word I have spoken in you. Now, here's what I don't want you to miss. The Greek word here is katharos. Katharos. It's actually where we get our word catheter from. All right? And it literally means to clean and make pure. And I, I like this. I thought this was funny. And often purifying by fire. And if you've had a catheter in you, you think, yeah, amen. Purifying by fire. I got that one. Yep, I get it. Cool. We're doing biblical stuff every time we have that happen. All right? And here's what I want you to think. Here's what I want you to go. All right? I think that for most of us, here's how we've been doing life. We've been functioning as a vacuum cleaner, and we've been collecting junk. And eventually, what happens when you collect enough junk is what happens to your vacuum cleaner? It stops, stops working. It definitely stops working at the way that it should, at peak performance, and may stop working completely, right? And so I started wondering, what kind of junk would we collect? Like, what do you have in your life that you would go, hey, that's keeping me from working at Optimal? Or what is it in your life that... Ugh. Does your vacuum cleaner look like this at home? You know, the old ones that we used to have when we were kids, you couldn't see what you were collecting, and so you just hoped the house was getting clean. These new ones make you gross about what you're cleaning, right? You're like, oh my gosh, it's in my house, right? So here's what I started searching through. I started searching through and saying, all right, what would I have if I am a vacuum cleaner? What have I gotten in my life? And so I started looking through, and of course I got dust, which is cool because we're dust, and to dust we shall return. That's just kind of everyday stuff that happens. And then in this vacuum cleaner, I, I got a handful of keys. And I, I thought about the handful of keys, and I thought, you know, those might have got sucked up because I went through doors I shouldn't have gone through. I've been to places that I shouldn't have been. I've experienced things that God never wanted me to experience, whether right or wrong. And these keys represent doors and places in my life. And I thought, what else is in here? And I got some shredded paper that that kind of tells stories of my life that I, some of these I regret and some of these I wish I could do over and some of these I wish were still going on, but they've kind of been shredded and destroyed. And I got some photographs here because we got some relationships that should have ended or maybe should go on and they don't exist anymore. And what's in your vacuum cleaner? I started to think how often many of us, as we're revealed to the light, and suddenly God discloses who we are, that we begin to go, there's no way you can love, there's no way you can care for me, there's nothing you can do. But we forget that God says, I have come to Catharos, to clean, to make whole, to purify. Because after all, Jesus says God is the gardener, right? And so again, if we're going to stick with the change and simile, 
if we're the vacuum cleaner, Jesus is the electricity, God's the, now God becomes the designer, right? He becomes the manufacturer. He becomes the creator. He becomes the, the, the one who put it all together, who knows the plan, who knows what's going on. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my Father is the gardener. And what I think by that is I think that I'm saying to God at times like, hey, I've just made a mess of my life. I don't even know if you can fix it. And then I just started having more fun with the imagery because I thought, you know, this is the way most of us do sin. We go to the cross and we surrender to Jesus our life and our mess and everything and we lay it down. We've been to some service and we walk away going, thank you God for the healing and stuff. And then we get ready to leave and we're all excited like, yeah, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. And then we look back at the mess. I gave that to you, God. You've set me free from those burdens. And you know, God, this one this one's really important to me though. You mind if I you mind if I keep this one a little bit? I I just I'm gonna hold on to this here. I I don't know if I, I really I mean it just I'm not done being guilty about it enough yet. And some of these I don't need all these, but some of these pages, God, I I still I still need some of those and God offers us this freedom. And we just simply keep it around. And we hold on to it. I know you're the gardener. I know you're the manufacturer. I know you're the designer. But I want to hold on to it. And, 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 and here's what I thought was really cool. Is that I think most of us spend our life trying to define who we are. Like what am I going to be when I grow up? Who am I going to be? What's going to go on? And this is what Jesus says. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Remain in me. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Our relationship, excuse me, our identity is defined, defined by our relationship with God. Our identity is defined by our relationship with God. Let me say it one more time. Our identity is defined by our relationship with God. And this is huge. Because I talk to people all the time who are vacuum cleaners who want to be blenders. You know any of those people? They're vacuum cleaners and they want to be red sports cars. They're vacuum cleaners and that's what God made them to be. That's what they were designed. That was their purpose. That was their function. But they, they want to be a toaster. Many of us have lived fighting against what God has created us to be and what God desires for us. And we get to God and we're so wounded and broken. And I just see God holding us and then using this, this, this imagery, this simile, and God saying, you know, you've spent your life trying to be something you're not. Something that I didn't create you to be. You spent your life sucking up junk and chasing after the wrong stuff. Let's let it go. You're actually a vacuum cleaner. That's what I made you to be. I can fix you. I am the gardener. I can fix you. I am the repairman. I am the designer. I am the manufacturer. There is nothing in you that I don't know. I put every piece of you together. So we recognize our need that apart from God we can do nothing and eventually we go well then I need to be connected to Jesus I need to be plugged in if you will I need to have power and I need to be able to function and if I can get it in the cord thing we'll be good to go except I can't see anything there we go And Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But when you're connected to me, you can function the way I created you. Ten bucks an hour, I can come to your house too. I was wrapping up this thought and I just want to give you a few closing thoughts that I had for this. You ready? 
First of all, I want to remind you that uh, whether you're going to use the vine and the branch imagery or this, there is an enemy that longs to cut you apart from the power source. There is an enemy that is out to attack. And he can't cut you off from God without you giving him permission because you are protected by the hand of God. But there is an enemy that wants you to believe that, hey, 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 you can't trust that person that's running the vacuum cleaner. You can't trust that he's going to take you where you should go. He's going to lead you through the valley of the shadow of death, and then he's going to abandon you. You should let me cut you off. You need to be in charge of your own life. That's the lie Satan gives you. Here's the good news, right? The good news is this. Good news for the captives. Those who have had their heart imprisoned by sin, who feel like they are so clogged down by the junk of life, Jesus says, my father's a gardener. My father's a manufacturer. He's a designer. You can be set free. You no longer need to live with that junk. Good news for the addict. You're not on your own power. Jesus, the power source that you are connected to, the only way to be alive, says, I can do more than you can imagine. You're not on your own with what you're up against. Good news for the dead. One day we get a new body. In fact, there's a manufacturer who says... There's no warranty on this. You just get a new one when you die. Good news for the living dead. Those who are just sitting, who look like vacuum cleaners, who are vacuum cleaners and have not been plugged in yet. Jesus says, it is by faith in me that you get connected to the power source. Good news for those who've been abused, misused. Maybe they abused and misused themselves. For those who are broken, burdened, wounded, and wandering like me. The manufacturer and designer knows your purpose. And our eternal life goal is to honor Him. Let me give you this one last thought. I didn't want to leave without this. The mission of the church is what? To move people closer to Jesus. If you said that as an answer, you get a free straw Taco Bell today. To move people closer to Jesus. Here's what I was thinking. I, was, I just wanted to throw this in. It's kind of like a freebie, but I, I just love this. The longer I thought about this, the more I thought, oh, we can go so many places with this vacuum cleaner. It's such a wonderful idea. And you may leave going, he's such an idiot. It is not. And that's okay. Well, now, you know what? Jesus says, you are my body. Jesus, as the gardener's responsibility is to clean and help care for others, and I just thought, how cool is it that the job of the vacuum cleaner is to clean? Like, we are to go help others be come clean, to recognize the dirt in their life. To not do it in a way that offends, although the truth offends people enough, right? When suddenly you hold up and go, hey, you see all this? Everybody goes, eee. But to do it in such a way that people go, I want that. I want to be like that. I want to know what it is to live in the freedom that you're offering. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and all things will be added. Our main goal should be to connect to that line, to connect to the power source and function the way God intends us to function. Sucking good. pray with me. Lord Jesus, I'm going to bet no one's ever heard a sermon in, let's suck good. But I pray that every time anybody uses their vacuum cleaner now, we stop and go, I'm the vine, you're the branch. God, help us to connect with you, to define ourselves in every relationship we have out of our connection to you. Help us to recognize and disclose the junk in our life to you. But Father, we may not be full of this, but we may be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and we may become something different for your glory. Because Father, you are a good, 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 good God. And your plans for us are plans for your glory. May we recognize our dependency upon you. You are the I am. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
นะเราจะ take up our offering we're going to invite our ushers to come forward and we're going to sing a, a song by David Crowder uh, and uh, invite you to worship one last moment with us and uh, I absolutely love this song it's one of my favorite songs I was singing in the car uh, last night just kind of rocking out with it declaring that you know what I, I've been here 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 but that's no longer who I am My definition isn't by what I've done or what I've taken in or what junk I've sucked up. My identity is defined by the Holy God who says, "You are the branch; I am the vine." Or, as we like to say, "You are the vacuum cleaner; I am the power source." Hey, join us again next week. We have more conversations about who do you say that I am? Who was Jesus? Changes everything. As for now, I hope you go going. God, there's some things I got to get out of me. Some junk I keep trying to take back, even after I leave it at the altar with you. I need you because you are God, and I'm just a vacuum cleaner. May you go forth in the presence of God, fully connected to the power of Jesus Christ, because apart from Him, you can do nothing. the blessing of Jesus we send you forth. Amen.